that uh, made it impossible. Even if I have heard um, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of my country said that by mid-June, we will be free to travel in most of Europe. Uh, he was a bit cautious, but that means that the life is starting to, uh, to go in normal, more or less normal way. We still, well, we will see how it will affect uh, our activities, but I have found that webinar is a fantastic tool because it allows to connect people from different continents. And that's definitely an enormous advantage if you would like to have high level uh, workshop. And today we have exactly this. We have very high level uh, participants and speakers. I also would like to thank the people that joined our, to, to, at our webinar from the countries that have now holidays. So Europe is rather complicated. We have holidays that you do, don't expect them to be, but some countries have, some like mine does not have a holiday. So that is very much appreciated. So the idea today for webinar is really to look for new technologies, how methane emissions could be seen, measured, uh, noted, registered from the space or just flying over with drones or with aircrafts. And uh, on basis of this, we will discuss what is cost efficiency of this, how you can scale up it. And the next webinar in a week would look on the regulatory measures, how you could promote positive developments and how it could influence meat and regulation. So that is an overall frame. So this is the idea of one day uh, on-site uh, webinar, uh, on-site workshop is divided in two webinars, one today, one tomorrow, but it does not mean that we could not embark on some of the issues that will be uh, in the next webinar already today, if some of the speakers would really very much to like. So to introduce, uh, I will give the floor to Jonathan Banks uh, from Clean Air Task Force. Uh, Jonathan is a senior climate policy advisor and one of the persons that really has dealt with uh, uh, oil and gas methane emissions for quite substantial time. Jonathan, uh, the floor is yours. Great. Thank you. Um, let me share my screen. Uh oh, um, I'm getting host disabled attendee screen sharing. Can you enable me to share? If not, you can show my slides. Oh, there we go. Are you seeing my screen now? Yes, we do. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, thank you all for for uh, joining today, and thank you for the invitation to present. Um, I will uh, make some brief introductory remarks on on this issue, uh, and then turn it over to folks that are working on this um, around the world uh, to come up with new detection technologies um, focused primarily on. Um, aerial and, and space detection. Um, but I'm gonna start by just doing, you know, why are we even worried about this really? Um, first of all, um, we are nowhere near um, to being on track to meet our climate targets. Um, we need to be in the um, green or pink range here and we are headed way past all of this. So. Uh, looking around the world, you have to focus on things that we can start to make progress on. And methane is, is one of those things. Methane is uh, uh, currently responsible for about half of the near-term warming. Um, and over the next few decades, um, uh, the pollution, methane pollution is going to warm the planet almost as much as CO2. Um, methane levels also are rising um, much more quickly than had been in, uh, anticipated under the Paris Agreement. The uh, Paris Agreement, the, the lines on the side of uh, the, uh, the chart here, the dotted lines, show the various uh, uh, projections going out of what methane was going to be. 
um, only the um, highest scenario, the highest temperature change scenario had anything close to what we are observing as far as methane emissions. Um, everything else was for forecasting much lower emissions. So um, this rise in methane emissions is, has not been included in the Paris Agreement. And if the methane rise continues, meaning the Paris goals is going to be uh, very difficult, if not impossible, even under, even under the most optimistic CO2 reduction scenarios. The other reason we focus on methane is um, it's one of the most effective ways to change near-term climate. Um, while reducing CO2 is absolutely critical, uh, the benefits from CO2 reduction, which is the pink line there, um, take decades to kick in. In contrast, methane uh, reduces warming quickly because methane's intense warming is almost all in the de decades immediately after its release. But it's also important to note there in that green line that that's methane and CO2 and black carbon. Um, it's it's imperative that we reduce all of these pollutants at the same time in order to have any chance of meeting the targets that we've set out for ourselves on climate change. Natural gas, another reason to focus on methane um, is that natural gas is going to be around for at least the next 30 years and maybe longer. Between now and 2050, globally anywhere between 4,100 and 5,200 TCF of gas and 900 billion barrels and 1,300 billion barrels of oil is going to be pulled from the ground, even under the most favorable scenarios for zero carbon energy. If you turn that into an equivalency of power plants, or that is roughly uh, 1,900 to 2,400 coal-fired power plants running for about 30 years. That's the climate impact that you would see from that methane. It's also equal to about 130 to 170 years worth of U.S. gas production and 240 to 320 years of U.S. oil production. Um, and again, these are under optimistic scenarios for um, uh, gas production and oil production. Um, these are not um, uh, these are not some fantastic uh, increase in oil and gas production. These are fairly optimistic reductions in oil and gas. Uh, production over the next 30 years. Um, the other major reason for focusing on oil and gas methane is how cost effective it is to reduce. It's one of the cheapest uh, CO, it's one of the cheapest greenhouse gas reductions that exist. Um, it's much cheaper than any of the other methane emissions that are out there and it can provide a real near-term win on climate change at a fairly low cost with technologies that are readily available. Methane detection, which is why we're here today, uh, has come a long, long way um, in the last few years. Uh, for much of the history of the oil and gas industry, uh, to find a leak, you employed a very high-tech system called AVO. And I'm joking when I say it's high-tech. Um, it meant you walked around your installation listening looking and smelling, so audio, visual, olfactory. Um, and of course, this is for a gas that is um, uh, invisible, so you can't see it. Um, it doesn't have a smell until later on in the system. And unless it's a really, really big leak, it's not gonna make any noise. So um, that was the state-of-the-art system for many, many years. Um, things have come a long way though. Uh, today, we have multiple forms of highly sophisticated equipment based uh, systems for detecting methane emissions, uh, everything from optical gas imaging, such as uh, the infrared camera. Um, you have drive-by technologies um, mounted to cars that can drive around the fields detecting leaks, uh, drones, airplanes, satellites, even micro satellites are uh, being developed. All of these have changed how we see uh, methane leaks, how we uh, understand the system, uh, the natural gas system, and um, how much methane is coming from uh, that system. But we need to remember a few things. Um, in the end, identifying methane leaks, measuring methane leaks, um, the goal here is really threefold. First, to find the leaks. 
second, to measure the leak, and third, to fix the leak. And the third piece being the most important thing is that we fix the leak. Current and future methane detection and measurement technologies have to keep all of these in mind. Um, new air-based technologies um, also will not and cannot exist in a vacuum. You're not gonna have just one of these technologies that we're gonna be talking about today being everything that we need. A satellite has to operate in conjunction with many other different technologies, same thing with airplanes. Uh, if a satellite or airplane identifies a problem, a team with a handheld optical gas imaging uh, equipment is gonna have to go out to pinpoint most leaks. You know, the really big ones are gonna be a little bit more obvious, but to pinpoint most leaks down to the specific piece of equipment, they're gonna have to be out there with the optical gas imaging equipment or some other uh, similar type of equipment so that they can fix that leak. So the questions really um, for today is how is, um, how are these technologies that we're talking about, how are those gonna change our approach to methane going forward? Some of these, I, I, these are not, uh, the points I have here are not uh, all encompassing, but hopefully we'll get through more of these uh, today. Um, reduce cost. Um, when we, right now, the current kind of state of the art for um, leak detection and repair is what we call quarterly LDAR. So that's sending teams out um, four times a year to check each facility. Every time you send a team out, um, it can be fairly expensive. It, that expense is typically offset by gas savings, but it's still a uh, time consuming and can be a relatively costly exp um, uh, practice. Um, in some parts of the world, due to weather uh, or to safety concerns in the area, it's extremely difficult to get out there, especially four times a year. Um, and so that's, um, you know, reduced cost and is, is a huge uh, benefit of some of these technologies we'll be talking about. Increased coverage and frequency is another one. Uh, both air base and satellite measurements can provide a much greater coverage of the planet's oil and gas fields with satellites promising near total coverage, um, as well as near daily coverage for the satellites. Uh, but of course, processing time is gonna be a key factor that um, uh, the, the satellite uh, data is gonna have to overcome. The other big uh, opportunity here is really an easier identification of super, emit super emitters. And we talk a lot about super emitters, these large emissions, emission points that uh, are the predominant source of emissions in the oil and gas sector. Um, they're typically um, not, you can't really predict when a super emitter is going to happen or where it's going to happen. So having daily uh, coverage of the oil and gas industry allows us to identify those super emitters when they happen and get out there and fix them. But we also will need to cut other emissions to really drastically cut methane pollution. We can't simply focus on the super emitters. They're the most important part, but we also need to get at the other emissions as well. And some of these higher resolution uh, technologies like satellites uh, and air base may have a harder time getting down to something like a pneumatic device. And that is going to be something we'll also need to continue to focus on, where we need to focus on um, a changing out equipment that we know is a problem. So a high bleed pneumatic, you're not going to see necessarily a high bleed pneumatic from a satellite, but we know it's a problem. So we know we can go out and fix it. We don't need to go out and measure it or anything. Let's just change that out. So it's a combination of the two. The other uh, promise of uh, aerial measurements is a better understanding of total emissions. Most of the stuff that we use today uh, to uh, detect leaks in the systems, such as optical gas imaging equipment, they don't measure methane, they simply identify it. The new technologies are measuring methane at the same time they identify the leaks, so it provides a better understanding of these total emissions. Um, the other big promise for, uh, for a lot of us is the ability to see places we can't go and the possibility of new methane mitigation policies. And by that, I mean having uh, teams out in certain parts of the world, uh, in certain countries of the world, is not going to be a possibility. Um, 
but with a satellite, we can see what's going on in Russia. We can see what's going on in Algeria. We can see what's going on uh, throughout Nigeria um, in places where we might not be able to send teams to measure or uh, detect leaks. So that creates some new opportunities for methane mitigation policies. It allows us to have a system where a country or a union of countries such as the European Union could inst uh, uh, instigate policies that tried to address methane that was coming into its country through pipelines. Um, you could have a policy that set a, um, a certain leak rate for um, oil and gas that was coming into the country and that could be backed up by data from satellite and aerial measurements. And I think that's the new forefront of methane mitigation policies and it's entirely dependent on the ability to have these kinds of new technologies that can verify what's going on in places that we can't necessarily get to ourselves. The final point that I'll make is in all of this, um, the data that's collected needs to be public in some form because at the end of the day, the public uh, as well as policymakers need to be able to look and see that methane mitigation is happening and they need to be able to see what the methane emissions are and this data that's collected from satellites or aerial measurements needs to have some form of public data uh, at the end of the day so that we have confidence in the reductions that we hope are going to be happening. And with that, I will stop and we'll turn it over to people who actually um, can talk about some of these technologies. Thank you, Jonathan. It was really a brilliant presentation. Uh, all the opportunities are here. Um, I would like uh, to remind our participants that you have two tools. One is a chat. Um, I saw Konstantin Romanov uh, is very active inviting you for discussion. So I know that you are interested in what is being said, but please feel free also to chat on it. The second tool is question and answers. I know that the time usually is limited, but uh, please uh, leave your questions that I could uh, ask uh, our speakers, or sometimes they could answer directly. So that is another tool that is possible, and that would make more interaction. So don't hesitate to put questions uh, to Jonathan, what he has said, or uh, also your opinion. It's not only question, what is your opinion, what was uh, mentioned by Jonathan. And now we're moving to the first of the panel. It is, a, a tech, we called it the technology perspective. Basically, uh, for me, like uh, coming into this area, it's very important to understand what technology can do and what can't do, and what is the dynamic to be anticipated. And we have excellent speakers in this uh, round table, but I will start with the com company. The company uh, called is Scientific Aviation. President Stephen Connolly uh, is definitely very much could say about it because, as I understand, he provides the services. So he knows most what he can do it and what is possible already now and where some work is being uh, needed. Uh, Stephen, uh, please uh, start um, your presentation. Okay, sorry about that. I was muted. Um, so yeah, what I want to talk about today is just how airplanes and drones sort of fit in this picture. And actually what Jonathan said is very true. And I always like to use the term, there's no silver bullet. So no matter what you're sort of after, there's going to be a toolbox of different technologies that will help. And there's not going to be one that does everything. And so this is, I'll talk about how airplanes can fit into that. So I start off with kind of this motivation statement. And this is a famous picture that the EDF took of the Aliso Canyon leak, which was America's largest uh, methane leak in history. And when you look at the picture, it does a great job sort of, of, of motivating the discussion. But the one thing it doesn't do is give you any idea of how much gas that is. Is that one cubic foot per hour or a million? It's really difficult to tell from looking at the picture. And so we kind of get into this, this realm of wanting to actually understand and quantify how much are we looking at? Because that's the only way you can make progress toward any of the goals that we're talking about with the climate. So the technique that we use, and this is the same whether it's the planes or the drones, is 
you basically want to enclose the source that you're interested in. So that the picture here on the left shows kind of the theoretical idea that the, you've got some source on the ground here. It's emitting some gas cloud that includes methane. And the airplane sort of flies this coffee can shape around that source. And as long as you have wind blowing, then at some point that wind is going to blow that gas through the downwind part of your flight path where the airplane can measure it. And so as long as you have measurements of the methane and the wind, you'll be able to put them together to figure out how much methane blew into your coffee can and how much left. And the difference is what to set the strength of that surface source. So that's kind of a theoretical. And if you look at the right side here, these are actual flights now. So the, this is an aircraft flight over an underground storage facility in California. And what you see in the white arrow is showing that the wind is coming kind of on the Northwest here. And what you see is south of the facility, these large methane enhancements. So that's what the airplane is doing. It actually will capture the total amount of methane that's moving through this area. Similarly for the drone here, we have a little well pad and the drone is flying on the sort of West side of it. And you see that it's picking up an enhancement just downwind of the tanks. That's the idea of doing these two systems. The one question that we get all the time is this idea of why do we need to go through all the trouble to quantify emissions? Like, why can't we just look at the PPM level, the concentration of methane? And I find this uh, example shows it really well. So these are two different flights, two different times in different places. And what you see, if you look at the blue lines, is that in both cases, the methane rises and the left by about 25 ppm and on the right up to about 60 ppm. So if you knew nothing else, you might look at these two and assume that these two were either similar sources or maybe you'd even think the one on the right's a little bit bigger, maybe double. In truth, the one on the left is Aliso Canyon at its peak, about 60 tons per hour. And the one on the right is a typical well pad, about 10 tons per year. And so the point of this is that just looking at the concentration alone is totally unhelpful in connecting it to an emission rate. You at least need to know the width and height of the plume and the wind speed. Without that, the, the concentration is pretty useless. So how, what do you need to do this? And what I'm showing you here is the aircraft that we use, but obviously, as long as you meet these requirements, this doesn't need to be this particular airplane. You could do this with any airplane that you had locally. But basically, you need a way to bring in the gas that you're trying to measure. And so to do that, like what you see on the wing here is these inlets. They need to be, the reason they stick down so far is they need to be outside of the aircraft boundary layer. And they need to be away from the exhaust. So that's requirement number one. And then number two is that you have an instrument capable of measuring the gas that you're interested in, in this case, methane, and measuring it at a high enough speed since you think the airplane is moving at 70 meters per second. Basically one second data is about as slow as you can get before it just, you're not gonna see much. And then to make this into a density, you're gonna also need to measure temperature and pressure and humidity. You need obviously enough AC power for all whatever instruments you're carrying. And most important, you need to measure the wind. So the wind ends up being key for any of these studies where you wanna talk about emissions. Oh, and then I guess my favorite is that you need a plane that can fly low and fly slow. You don't, you don't wanna be just zipping by and then you, you make the plume sort of less, get less detail. So how are we gonna use these airplanes? I got some examples here. So this was a study that, that we did for the, for the US government actually in Arkansas. And what you see like in this particular flight path was just designed to find emission sources. And you see they become pretty obvious, like the ones we, as we're flying this, this sort of lawnmower pattern here, you see that wherever there's a big emission source, it stands out pretty clearly. And you can see this in real time so that it can actually, like you see, the circles around this one. So as the pilot was flying this, they saw the big emission and then circled it to quantify it like we showed on the previous path. But the other thing you can do with this is once you've covered this entire area, it also enables you to calculate what we call a mass balance. So to get the emission for the entire basin, 
which is also really helpful because it that's sort of the best measure we have of how we're making progress. So the, the problem with doing the individual site measurements is that you run into the statistical problem that I don't know when I measured that site, was that a representative sample? In other words, was there some big event going on right then that I just happened to catch or did I miss the event? And so the nice thing about doing an entire basin is that if you cover 10,000 sites in that basin, statistically, some of them are going to be leaking, some of them are not, some are under maintenance, some are not. So it gives you a much better sort of upscalable number that you can then use to come up with your sort of annual averages. But the last thing that the aircraft does that's really helpful is it can respond quickly. And so like in this case, and the third thing that we were doing on this is whenever the operator had some maintenance event or a ground crew found something, they would call the aircraft on the radio and the aircraft could be there within a few minutes to actually measure it. So one of the strengths of the aircraft is just its speed, that it can be places quickly. So this is another great example of where the aircraft are useful uh, to the catastrophic failure event. So this was uh, late in 2015 and the gas company in Southern California discovered a leak. State of California wanted to know how big it was because residents were getting sick. And so they dispatched one of our aircraft and we had the number within two hours of their dispatch. And so that's a really powerful feature of an aircraft that if you have an event, say the Aliso Canyon spill or, I mean, or leak or the BP spill that, that you can have uh, answers quickly. And in this case, those answers were necessary for the state of California to sort of gauge their response. The governor declared a state of emergency based on the numbers that they got from the aircraft. So other thing is the places that the aircraft can go. So for example, this is flights that we did in the Norwegian North Sea, where you can use the aircraft to look at different types of, of emission sources, in this case, offshore platforms but places that would be obviously difficult to go with vehicles. So some other techniques that might not work well, would work well in this type of environment. And then moving down. So the one limitation that aircraft have is simply the detection limit. So because we're flying say a kilometer away from the source, we don't see the smallest sources. And the limit we typically quote is that we will see reliably 10 kilograms per hour and up. Drones, on the other hand, because they can fly in close, because they can stop on a dime, your drones are going to be about a thousand times better. So in that 10 gram per hour range, all the same requirements. The drone needs to measure the wind. It needs to measure the gases. It doesn't need to have such a fast analyzer because you can control the speed. It's also nice with the drone that it can get really low. So even if the boundary layer doesn't have a lot of mixing, your drone can still get low enough to measure it. One requirement that we typically have for the drones is that you need a real-time display of that methane so that you know when you found something so that you then know to go quantify it. <clears throat> Here's some examples of, the, of what the drone can do. So this is actually a facility we were flying in the Ukraine. And what you can see is that you can fly the entire facility, which gives you these ideas of where your emission sources are. In addition to that, it gives you this plot here is the quantification. So it shows you as we're down low, we get the biggest emission that drops off with altitude. And then we can get a site number as well as we can go quantify any individual source that we want. That's something you cannot do with the airplane or really the satellite. It, this is something that you need the sort of more precise tool. So depending on the goal, this is where a drone may be better than an aircraft. I was going to show this just sort of video. Hopefully this works over the chat over the window here. So what you can see here is that we're flying these tanks and you see as we get downwind of tank one, this massive spike of methane, which is the one nice thing about flying with a drone compared to an OGI camera is that when you encounter these big sources, they're really obvious. You take out some of the art form that you would have with an OGI camera. If you see it, like in this case, three of the tanks were fine and one of the tanks had a really large leak. So that's sort of the strength of the drone. And the one thing it doesn't do, unfortunately, is the level of pinpoint that a camera does. So this is sort of the, kind of my take on the state of the industry and 
where each piece fits. Now, if we start off at the highest level, farthest from the source, you have satellites. And a satellite typically is going to be in that ballpark of $25 per site per measurement. But it's going to pick up the largest super emitters, those in the hundreds of kilograms per hour. Well, this is expected to get better with new satellites being launched, and the cost will certainly get better with the EDF launch in 2020, 2022. But then moving down from the satellite, the next level, similar cost per site with one caveat. This does require that you have an area that you can get an airplane and that you have one nearby. So to get an airplane to the middle of Russia or Algeria is going to cost more than what I'm showing here unless you have an aircraft nearby. And then, uh, but the one advantage of the aircraft over the satellite is just the detection limit. And really that's just a function of it being closer. And that's typically how this scale works that as we get closer each time, the cost goes up and the precision goes, you get much smaller sources. So in this case, we go to a drone and the cost goes from 25 to $400 a site. But like I said, your detection limit goes better by a factor of a thousand. And similarly, cameras are going to be in the same ballpark with drones. They're a little more expensive because they're slower and the detection limit is very similar. And the one thing that, that sort of unrelated to aircraft, but I kind of believe fits in this spectrum, is the ground-based continuous monitoring systems. And those, if you have the ability to outfit sites, they're unbeatable for cost. That once you set up a ground system for something like $30 a month, you get continuous measurements of those large sources. So I think as those become more commonly available, you may see the, the usefulness of aircraft actually decrease, which is a very sad thing for me, but reality. If, um, oh yeah, and anyway, that's, that's all I had to talk about. It was awesome, uh, Stephen. It was fantastic presentation. It's a really great experience from practical side. But now we will try to look in the panel from uh, scientific sides. So our next speaker is Stephen Hamburg. He is a chief scientist in Environmental Defense Fund. And you would ask what chief scientist does. Actually, it's quite a task. He ensures the scientific integrity of EDF positions and programs. So basically, whatever is being said or done by EDF should go through his evaluation of scientific uh, integrity and science is used to change. So Stephen, uh, what is your views on this particular topic on aerial measurements uh, of methane emissions? Thanks so much. It's uh, great to um, be here and it's great to follow Steve and to have Ilza uh, coming uh, next since it's this has really been a community of scientists and uh, experts who've been working on this uh, problem uh, for for better part of a decade. Um, I want to talk about a little bit about the data that has been collected to date, and then talk about methane sat the that Steve referenced, the satellite that we're in the middle of constructing and will be launching soon. And as Jonathan said, methane is an incredibly powerful greenhouse gas. He framed it in terms of current emissions going forward. If we look at the warming we're experiencing today, not the past of all the emissions, it's responsible for more than a quarter of the warming. And the oil and gas sector is an incredibly important, as Jonathan said, element of that picture. They're important. A quarter to a third of total, depends a little bit, we've got to resolve those numbers. The analytics, and Jonathan framed this, I won't spend much time on it, but is really important because methane is a short-lived climate pollutant. How much methane can be emitted from natural gas production before it really undercuts the advantage of it being a much higher energy product per molecule of CO2 emitted when it is burned, it varies. And this is a paper we published with some analytics that are built on things described in the IPCC, but really take those analytics further. So I'd encourage the audience to really get familiar with how to think about these issues analytically in a little more sophisticated way than just using GWP 100 or even just GWP 20. Time really matters and its influence matters and fuel switching as this slide demonstrates can be really impacted by the net rate of forcing influences of methane emissions along the supply chain. This paper is, you'll be able to see it's in 
uh, PNAS in 2012. So I want to just quickly summarize some work that we did over about eight years in collaboration with hundreds of scientists across the United States, including Steve, um, where we looked at a really detailed look at a methane emissions across the United States from the oil and gas supply chains. Um, this work looked at sites representing about one third of the production across the United States, so it's geographically varied and using a diversity of methods, many of which Steve described, but not all of them. And the results of that were summarized in a paper in Science in 2018, uh, where with co-authors, about 25 co-authors from 19 institutions, again, representative of these hundreds of scientists who, who worked on it from both the academic world, government, and the private sector. And the, the reason I want to mention this is because we have begun to build a much clearer understanding of the pattern of methane emissions in the United States. We are currently working to build that globally, but it's really important to understand where those emissions are coming from and what those patterns are, as again, uh, Jonathan talked about and Steve after him. When we look at just the United States methane emissions, the results that we published in that paper showed that for the year 2015, emissions were about 60% higher um, in reality than what was estimated by the US EPA inventory. And this is an important methodological issue because the EPA uses a, a bottom-up um, emission factor, activity factor, inventory approach, as opposed to the empirical approach that Steve described, where you can really integrate the full spectrum of emissions patterns, uh, which are both those you would expect and those you would not. If we look at which portions of the supply chain those emissions come from, you'll notice that on the left, we have drilling, production, followed by gathering and processing, transmission, storage, and then local distribution. The bulk of it is on the left. It's in the production gathering processing. It's happening in the field. That's not all of it, but that's where most of the emissions are occurring and they're systematically higher than you would expect from inventories. This is critically important to recognize. Those things unexpected, those things that are upsets happen regularly. Um, and we need to understand when and where, again, as Steve described and Ilisa will talk about after me with respect to using remote sensing tools, Tripomi. And when we looked at the bottom up and top down, we use bottom up and top down here, but it's really a little bit of a misnomer because the bottom up here is still an integrative site level. It's not an inventory based, it's empirically based. So empirically based data from individual sites versus the kind of aircraft uh, data that Steve collected a lot of this data actually and his team, um, and it aligns extremely well. So we have strong agreement between these methods. We're confident they work, we understand them. That doesn't mean there isn't still lots of room for improvement, but we're no longer debating which is better or how to compare them. We understand that. That body of literature is rich. There are dozens and dozens of papers in many different environments. So um, we have a good solid scientific foundation. And then for, we looked at thinking about where these emissions come from. We have some of them that are, are, are by design, the equipment or the processing involves release of methane. And on the left-hand column, we see those are those that are part of it. They may, some of them may be very small, some may be larger. Um, and then on the right side are those that are unintended. So those are the leaks, those are the things that happen. And in the upper uh, right-hand corner, call it super emitters, larger emissions unintended. Now it's important to note the term super emitter gets used by many people in many different ways. A lot of super emitters are not visible to most of the technology. Steve talked about 10 kilograms per hour of methane that would be visible in that box based on the definition we use there, but most of the tools, remote sensing and other things. So super emitters are an important piece of, but as Jonathan said, by no means, if we just look at super emitters, will we understand the problem or find the majority of gas? In some cases like Elisa Canyon, or we have very large blowouts, those are very big events. But most of the time, the routine, either by design or the site level smaller emissions or the smaller super emitters account for an overwhelming majority of the emissions. So we have to be careful that we're not just looking for the emissions uh, where the very big emissions. And the, the old adage 
why was the drunk looking for the keys under the street light? Because that's where the light was. Well, we have tools that can see very big emission sources. Those are very important, but they are not by any means all that we need, nor necessarily accounting for the majority of the emissions. We need to look at across the globe. Uh, I serve as the chief scientific officer for a uh, international series of methane studies coordinated by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition of UN Environment Program. And it's done collaboratively with the um, oil and gas climate initiative companies. Um, but we have to remember this is not just a US based, it's not just Europe, it's not just Russia, the Middle East, it's a whole sort of countries. Um, and we need to begin to build an understanding comparable to what we have in the United States or even better in those sites across the world. We're beginning to do that. But as Steve said, you know, getting a plane to fly in a lot of these geographies is not easy. We've been working on that, but it, it's very difficult. We end up with snapshots at best. And that's why remote sensing will be an integral part. Not sufficient, but definitely an integral part. I wanna to shift to the uh, last couple of minutes to the methane sat mission, which is really built on all of this previous work and what additional data do we need and to use the TRIPOMI um, data that Ilsa will talk about to really begin to build what the data sets that we need to be able to understand this problem um, effectively. So methane sat is uh, a mission that we're in the middle of uh, building and will launch in 2022. Uh, we have contracts with Ball Scientific um, at Ball uh, era to build the instrument and uh, Blue Canyon Technologies to build the bus. Um, all the data will be free. Um, we'll start flowing data uh, three months after launch. We have a science team at Harvard at the Smithsonian Astro Astrophysical Observatory and EDF. It's funded fu privately through philanthropy and run by MethaneSat LLC. Um, we're going to target the oil and gas industry. We'll be able to look at methane emissions from other sources, but our primary focus is oil and gas. We do have a partnership with the New, New, the New Zealand Space Agency that will be focusing on agricultural emissions. And we'll be looking at acquisitions on a daily basis with a return time about every three days uh, possible. Now, the key here is that we will be able to look at both area diffuse sources like Tropomi, but with a greater precision. So we'll be able to see, Steve talked about seeing 10 kilogram per hour, we we'll should be able to see about two to five kilograms per hour per square kilometer for area to sources. So these smaller sources, which add up in a lot of regions to a large proportion of the total emissions across the region. We won't be able to say exactly where it's coming from, but we will be able to quantify in the aggregate those emissions. And um, so that's a critical piece. We'll also see point sources so we're basically combining target mode instruments and the, um, the mappers like Tripomi, which is an incredibly powerful tool that's getting us uh, making a lot of progress in understanding these. We'll bring those together in the methane sat mission. This is just a comparison of the different missions, including Tripomi uh, with the uh, bands we'll be using and the swath width will have 200 kilometers and the precision on the right side, which is critically important be able to collect the level of data that we think we need, what we know we need to be able to fully quantify missions across the globe. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Stephen. It was really a brilliant presentation. Um, I saw that there are already some questions asked, so there was all the questions answered. So thank you very much, Steve, uh, for answering the questions. There is, as again, I remind chat, uh, um, Constantine is very active, inviting, I think, also to join if you have a moment for this. Uh, we are now moving for our next presentation. I am really honored that Ilse Aben, uh, she is senior scientist at Netherlands Institute for Space Research, who join us today. And uh, well, uh, she has this, is a leading scholar. Um, I, I just would mention one of the latest publication where she participated. It is a satellite discovery uh, of anonymously large methane uh, point sources from oil and gas production. So it is really somebody who is a top scientist that joined our, our seminar. Uh, Ilze, uh, the floor is yours.
Okay, I had to find my unmute button as usual. Okay, are you seeing, well, it's black now, but it's coming. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, we do. Oh, okay, we do. thank you. Okay, great, thanks. And um, I'm happy to be here and speak about um, methane satellite observations with uh, Tropomi. Okay. Not sure if my, okay. My full screen is not giving me the opportunity to actually move to my next slide. Okay, sorry, I need to get out of this first. Okay, I'm not having any screen anymore now. Yeah, here. I'm not sure if I can get it in uh, presentation mode. I just was not able to get it to the next slide. Um, Ilse, would you like me to help and share the screen for yeah, you? Yeah, maybe that, that's best. So um, you may simply say next, okay? When right. I just need to... Can, can you see the slides now? Uh, but it's not in presentation mode the way I see it. Is that correct? I do see the slides, but yeah. it's not in presentation mode. Right? Or is it in presentation uh, mode for, for me, everyone actually, else? I can try this again. For me, uh, it is now, yes. Um, I'm asking Andres maybe to double check. Uh, what I see now is a presentation mode. Yeah. Same as me, I see as well. Okay, okay let me just try. Uh, and. and so I'm back to the cover and I would like you to simply say next when you want. Of course, you right. can see if you can see. That's it. fine. Next slide, please. <laughs> okay, I'll just give you some information on the Tropomi instrument, which is a uh, single instrument on the so-called Sentinel-5 precursor mission and was developed by the Netherlands and ESA and is operational since May uh, 2018. And it's part of Europe's Copernicus program uh, where the space component uh, consists of the so-called Sentinel missions. And um, the Sentinel-5 precursor is the first atmospheric in a series to come, which is why we're called the precursor. We are actually the precursor to the Sentinel-5 mission, which will contain a similar instrument like Tropomi, and will have a, um, consecutive launches of those instruments. So covering basically at least two decades of very similar observations. Um, Tropomi measures not only methane, it measures actually quite a few species, um, but methane is what we'll be uh, talking about today. And what's important to realize is that for most of these species, including methane, we actually measure uh, its concentration um, over the full column in the atmosphere. So from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface, that's the average concentration we measure. Um, What's important is that the, daily is freely, uh, the data is freely available and actually available within three hours. But then we're talking about concentrations and not emissions yet. So these are concentrations available within three hours, although for methane currently it's two days. Click please. And one more click. Yeah, so what I wanted to show uh, below is just what makes these measurements of Tropomi uh, rather unique. Um, is that we actually measure a strip simultaneously across the globe um, of 2,600 kilometers, as you can see shown. And these are consist of 200 observations. And each of these observations actually sees an area of uh, seven by five and a half kilometer. So we see, two, we have 200 observations um, giving this strip of 2,600 kilometers in one second, and then the satellite orbits the earth. And so after one and a half hour, you basically have one orbit giving you this, this um, 2,600 kilometers uh, area that is across the globe. And after a day, you have 14 of these orbits. You basically cover the whole globe with individual observations of seven by five and a half kilometers. Um, so that's what it makes this unique. You have global daily coverage with very high spatial resolution of individual observations. The, 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 the plot in the middle actually shows you what we're using. We're using solar light that illuminates the Earth atmosphere. There it's being absorbed at different wavelengths. And uh, so the different molecules, including methane, have their own fingerprint. 
and uh, the amount of um, how much light is being absorbed tells us something about the actual concentration. Next slide, please. Yeah, a few words about uh, satellite observations of methane. Um, they're complementary, for example, to the surface network, but also to aircraft measurements or drone measurements. And so the unique thing about satellites is that they're global, but they're very challenging for methane. And that relates to the fact that uh, the lifetime of methane in the atmosphere is about 10 years, which means that when you emit methane at the surface, it remains in the atmosphere, it gets transported in all directions, and uh, it remains in the atmosphere for 10 years. And this means that uh, you have in principle a large background of methane concentration that we also measure with the satellite because I said we measure basically the concentration averaged from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface. Then we have this huge background of methane and but what you're interested in are actually the emissions that happen at the surface and they give a very small change of that um, uh, average column uh, uh, over the whole, um, yeah, which is average over the whole column, which is basically referring to what Stephen said earlier, Stephen Conley, about the detection limits of satellite. That's really much affected by this. And in the end, we are looking for very, very small gradients in that concentration uh, field. And that is what makes it challenging. In addition, we have to have cloud-free observations. And th this means that in the end, we can only use a few percent of our data, but we measure about we do about 10 million observations a day, so we still have quite some observations left. Okay, next please. Now what I'll do, I'll just go through uh, three case studies that we did, just to give you a flavor of what we've done so far. And um, I start off here with uh, an accident that happened in Ohio in 2018. There was a blowout, and it took uh, about three weeks to actually cap this. And in the meantime, uh, lots of gases, including methane, were spewed into the atmosphere. And uh, the question was if we were actually able to see it in our observations. And uh, in fact, we did. And that's what is shown on the right. And we were even able to determine how much methane was emitted to the atmosphere um, while we were measuring it. And this is, in fact, the only methane measurement related to this event um, that we have. And that illustrates the strength of routine satellite measurements in detecting and quantifying methane emissions of unpredictable events. Next slide, please. Another study, which was led by EDF and Harvard here, using tropomy data, methane tropomy data, was looking at the Permian Basin. And the Permian Basin is the largest oil producing basin in the US. And, on the, and it has been increasing quite a lot in the past decade in its production. I think it has gone up fourfold. Um, on the left hand side, you actually see the whole of the US, the methane that is measured by Tropomi, and the Permian Basin is in that square, so it's zoomed in. You can actually see, so it's in New Mexico and, and Texas. You can see uh, uh, the two basins and, and the elevated concentrations of methane. And in this study, we showed that the emissions. Uh, using tropomi methane data actually uh, showed there were more than twice what, the, um, uh, what we know from the uh, emission inventories. So this shows how important it is to actually perform atmospheric measurements to verify what the estimates that we have in the emission inventories that are based on activity data. Next, please. Next, yeah, thanks. Um, the last example is one where we collaborate with GHGSAT. That's a commercial uh, Canadian company, and that has launched a small SAT in 2016 already, uh, its first one. And soon there will be a, a new one launched also by the end of the year and, and more to follow. And they focus on um, very high spatial resolution observations. So trying to measure methane at facility scale. So their individual observations um, look at an area of 50 by 50 meters. But the downside of course is they uh, can only see um, a certain area uh, in a certain amount of time. So per orbit, per one and a half hour, this first satellite can only see one area of 10 by 10 uh, square kilometer. And on the right hand side, you actually see an example of this. This is a coal mine in China, and you see the, the methane plume um, coming off. Um, next slide, please. And at a certain point, they contacted us because they were looking for methane emissions from a mud volcano, and then they saw something else. Um, 
And that was actually this picture that you're seeing now. So the blue that you see is actually the, the, the enhanced methane that they have uh, observed. And please look at the scale. So the white bar at the bottom shows you what one kilometer is. Um, and you see um, something coming off from what is denoted with the white circle and uh, blowing away with the wind. So that's a clear methane, methane leak. Uh, next, please. And it's actually, or yeah, thanks. So it's actually the, the GAG set measurement that's actually uh, superimposed on a digital um, a globe image below. And if you zoom in, you can actually see very nearby a compressor station. And if you closely look, you see a pipeline going, actually going to that white circle where the, the methane is clearly coming from. Um, they asked us to actually look in our data because we were, we can, we measure the globe every day, uh, roughly, and uh, so we can look in the archive and um, uh, if we could actually see the signal. And that's what's shown below for three different days, but you can actually pick almost any day. And what you see is the black square in the middle is actually the area that uh, GAG sat, looks at. It's a bit bigger than what you see uh, uh, on the top. And, um, and you see shown the tropomy observations, the methane concentrations. And also in each of them, you see the wind direction with, uh, with the arrow. So you clearly see enhanced emission coming from um, that area. Uh, one click, please. And so we were able to see uh, these uh, emissions coming from that area as of the first observations in Tropomi, which were um, more than a year before, uh, uh, before this first observation of GEG set, so from November 2017 onward. And uh, this information was communicated to the actual um, authorities there. And this is in Central Asia, actually in Turkmenistan. And a few months later, we actually could conclude that we did not see any emissions coming anymore from this, um, from this specific location. So we have to conclude that the leak was actually fixed, which I think is a big success. Yeah, the next step is, and that's what we've been doing since, is that we actually use this synergy between Tropomi and GHGSAN, where Tropomi actually covers the whole earth in one day. And then you globe, so we look at, we can look globally and then find hotspots and then actually communicate these hotspots in methane to GEG sets so that they can zoom in and look at what facility exactly uh, is potentially leaking. And that is, of course, I think a very powerful tool to uh, identify localized methane leaks at facility scale. One click, please. And I like this, um, this um, a cartoon from The Economist where they basically suggest, you know, with the satellites, we could actually help reduce uh, and uh, fix these leakages. Okay, next slide, please. Yeah, just wrapping up. Um, uh, so far, um, we've published and, and looked at in detail a few case studies. Uh, these were large emissions uh, with, seen with Tropomi. But we have, so we have detected persistent sources like the Permian and, and the one in uh, Central Asia, but also transient sources like the one in Ohio, uh, both point sources and area sources. And we have developed uh, various methods to quantify the emissions and which we will further improve on. Uh, and also we've been developing automated tools now for detection um, uh, and we will also do that for the quantification. And I think there's a unique potential in combining Tropomi-like uh, global observations in a day with a GHG set-like very high spatial resolution at facility scale uh, observations to really pinpoint emissions at facility scale. And what we've done so far will also serve in preparation of the upcoming Sentinel-5 missions. Uh, again, that will be two decades of similar observations and also uh, for the CO2, Europe CO2 mission that in fact will not only measure CO2, but also uh, methane. Thank you. Thank you, Ilse. Well, uh, I have not got too many questions, only one and Steve have answered, but um, I will ask something technology and specific questions that interests me. So EU has announced huge recovery instrument where its intention is invest in recovery, but also partially reform. There is a next year, next budget, seven years budget announced. And if you would have a real impact, uh, would you say, is this money necessary also to invest in technology development 
on uh, methane measurement, aerial measurement, satellite, or what you have presented for seemed at least for me, rather well simple sailing because uh, you can see the leaks are repaired. Uh, well, it is perhaps expensive, but is there something in technological development that needs really to be accelerated, where more money need to be invested, uh, really to to increase the speed of methane emissions reduction. Um, so that question basically goes for all of you. So it's basically your wish list if there is EU money and somebody would say, well, we would like to force, uh, focus on methane emissions, where exactly in technology it should be invested? So maybe I'll start. Uh, uh, this is Steve Hamburg. Um, I think one of the places where we are seeing progress, but we're not there yet, and Steve uh, Connolly and I think Jonathan mentioned, is continuous monitoring of methane at the site level. I like to use the example of the revolution caused by having in-home smoke detectors. Um, you know, when they go off, they're very good now. When they go off, you take, you take action, and if you don't have them, people die in fires. We need the same with CO2, uh, with methane emitters, as what we have for CO and, and, and smoke. And they are getting better, but we're not yet there where you can put them on all facilities running continuously. They're cheap and effective. That would be a big help. Similarly, um, we need to continue the progress in remote sensing. Um, we're obviously planning to launch methane sat soon and the European um, Space Agency, uh, Ilza talked about the upcoming Sentinel projects. We need to accelerate that, get better coverage. The number of target mode instruments is still limited. Um, GHGSAT uh, is going to fly a second instrument, but we have limited capacity. So I think we need to continue the work we're doing, but accelerate it so we get even better at what we're doing and we need to do it quickly because the returns are enormous. Ilza? Do you have any views on this? No, I, I, I agree with Steve. I also think that we should, um, again, when we say global daily coverage with satellites, um, uh, and I made the point about the that we need cloud-free observations, which does mean that we only are left with a few percent of the observations on a, at the daily scale. And some areas are more cloudy and more persistently cloudy. So from space, it really helps if you have more observations. So you can basically, fill that gap. I need to s silence my phone. Um, so that's, that's one thing. So I think, uh, and the other thing is this, um, I also think we need to put in more effort into the technology of actually using this data. So translating um, from the measurements, the concentration measurements to the emissions. And um, uh, I think there's still uh, a lot to be gained there in, um, well, speeding up the process. Um, my goodness. Um, so, so that's, um, and I think this combination with at different levels, uh, having, uh, different scales. So on one hand, tropomy, uh, but that does not have a spatial resolution or each observation is five by seven uh, kilometers. Uh, then going higher, zooming in with either GHG set type or, uh, aircraft type of observations or drones is, uh, can still be further improved, um, uh, Steve, uh, I will slightly reformulate the, the question to you because you are representing uh, industry and giving services. So uh, what you advise uh, for companies, for example, from technological, uh, should they keep this uh, VIO uh, uh, still observe method or should they completely rely on uh, IRL measurements? No, well, first of all, addressing some of the other questions, the one thing I would say in terms of where we want to invest, to me, the largest waste that we currently have is that, so with the exception of our flights for EDF, when we fly for any operator, 90% of the flight is effectively not used. And what I mean by that is if we fly the Permian Basin, for example, for ConocoPhillips, all we're looking at is ConocoPhillips facilities, even though we're flying over Chevron and Exxon. And similarly with our continuous systems, when we deploy them for one operator, the sensors don't care 
where the leak is coming from. Ideally, we, if we, the, sort of to me, the biggest th advancement that we could get isn't so much the better technology, is it's the cooperation. So if we said all the operators in a certain area were going to work together and put a, one sensor on a site, but that site could, could provide emissions depending on the wind direction for all the sites around it, that's how you'd get the most bang for the buck. That's how you would drive this cost down. And it, it requires cooperation between the operators. And I think that historically has been the most difficult piece. Thank you. Uh, uh, Jonathan, please. I, I just wanna go back to your, your question before that, where you were asking about um, the investments that uh, places like the European Union are looking to make in response to the current pandemic and the collapse of uh, oil and gas globally, um, and, and you know we have we have to look at you know what is what's the purpose of those funds and what what's the goal of those funds. And in a lot of cases, the goal is obviously to start to see the economy recover. Um, there are in in most places around the world that are talking about this. There's not a whole lot of conversation about methane. Canada is one of the uh, exceptions to that. Canada set out a $750 million uh, fund for the reduction of methane. This is not going uh, specifically, or it's not specifically targeted at research or new technologies. It's targeted at, at methane in general. Um, and I think um, if more countries were to take on that kind of perspective of targeting um, uh, methane reductions as a way to bring people back to work, I think that would be a very good thing. The other piece that Canada has done is they put a huge chunk of money into going around finding and sealing um, old oil and gas wells, um, which is a huge problem in the United States and Canada, as well as in many other places around the world. So I think if you're looking for what countries have done regarding stimulus funding and recovery funding, I think Canada is a good place to start because they're kind of at the forefront of how to do this and still address methane emissions. Yeah, I think it was really, really helpful. I hope that somebody also from European Commission is listening because for me, it is sometimes that the money, when it comes, it comes where the more visible. In the EU, definitely it's a, it's a hydrogen, uh, how you supply it and, it's there, and some other issues. But methane emissions have been always somehow less exposed, less addressed, and uh, and definitely if there is money is coming and it is high tech technology being used, that makes somehow this uh, recovery instrument and also next financial pack package for research development very much, I think, welcome in this area. And that's why I wanted your advice really to, to, to what issues need to be addressed. But now we are moving to the second panel. I have also excellent panelists. Unfortunately, Paul Balcom, for personal reason, could not take part. But we have basically two companies. One is a company uh, where our president and founder, Antoine Rostand uh, of Kairos, um, he is long, has long experience with oil and gas being with, related to technology, but his company that is now he's leading, uh, his call is, well, that he represents a team to change the way businesses make decisions. So basically, really to provide uh, for oil and gas industry in new situation. Antoine, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. And um, so thank you for uh, the kind introduction, Andres. Uh, so yes, yeah, so Kairos is an um, analytics company. Uh, we are not a hardware company. We don't own assets. Uh, and what we do is we use um, uh, new information, in, partic in particular satellite imagery, to give reliable information on what's going on to a uh, decision maker in the energy space. So uh, we, uh, we follow uh, ships, uh, we look at production, uh, we track refineries, uh, we look at uh, crude oil tanks to look at the level of inventory. So we track all the full energy infrastructure. Uh, so we have a full understanding and uh, we've mapped all the energy um, related assets on a global basis. 
so when uh, so uh, when the tropomi data uh, have been available in 2019 we thought okay let's look at it to see how we can relate uh, our understanding of the energy space to uh, the measurement uh, of uh, sentinel 5p and uh, as you will see later you know in my presentation we found some very interesting results so I won't go spend too much time on the fact that the clock is ticking. Uh, we all know that uh, it has been uh, said also it's ticking for the planet. It's also ticking for the oil and gas industry, because if we don't cut methane, the door for natural gas as a transition uh, fuel is going to close. So the big news is that uh, uh, even though there is no silver bullet, uh, we believe, uh, and our customers, which are uh, large oil and gas companies, are convinced that the Sentinel 5P, and thank you, Ilse, for the great job you've done, is really a game changer. Because even though it is not, uh, you, know, you know, super resolute, uh, we can still, in many cases, identify plumes of methane and attribute them to specific assets and to companies and polluters, which means that it's the first time that we can break in methane this kind of vicious cycle where you don't measure what's going on, so you don't have no idea of the cleanliness of your import, and which means that, in fact, we don't reduce our actual emission in the EU, even though we spend a lot of money on subsidies. And the chart on the left, look at the CO2 emission embedded in trade, in trade, and unfortunately, we did spend a lot of money in the EU. We've reduced our own emission, but these emissions have been exported. Uh, there are some kind of off-balance sheet emissions that are imported back through energy or goods. And we have to break this uh, vicious cycle if we want one day to, uh, to have a chance to reduce, uh, to have an impact of climate change. And uh, really the big news here is Sentinel 5P is good enough in many cases to start this process. It's a, it's a process, it will start, so we'll focus on ultra emitters, so on the big, you know, more than 10 tons per hour um, leaks, but there are many of them, many more than everybody thought, and if we start with that, then we'll educate investors, operators, the public on this new way of thinking, which is not engineering based, but we measure, there is no place to hide. Obviously, we need Metsansat, you know, we need the next level of uh, spatial resolution and uh, level of detection to go to the super emitter and then the large emitter and then the medium emitters. But the very good news is today we can start. So, as I said, you know, a couple of months ago when uh, the data have been uh, released, so we've looked at uh, the, we've understood the data set and started to uh, detect uh, abnormal uh, plume of methane using uh, algos that were, in fact, uh, designed to detect black hole in the sky. Because, you know, as Ilse said, there is a lot of background noise, so we need to remove the noise. And we found, you know, many, many, many more large plume of methane than what were previously reported. From the literature, there are three ultra emitters, so more than 10 tons per hour that were documented, Ohio, Addison Canyon, and Turkmenistan. And some super emitters have been uh, documented in the GPL uh, study that has been done in California. So the super emitters are above one ton, one ton per hour. Uh, looking at uh, all the tropomy data over 2019, we've uh, found that there is more than 50 ultra emitters per day on average. So it's four order of magnitude more than what was previously thought about. I mean, it's not 10 times more, it's four order of magnitude more, you know, uh, number of uh, large leaks that we can find thanks to troponi. And half of them, this is the one that you can see here, come from an gas uh, infrastructure. So it's, uh, it's a bad news uh, because there are much more recent leaks than what we thought, but it's also good news because this one are very easy to fix. We know where they are now, thanks to uh, Tropomi and uh, the analytics we have in Kairos and the map of the energy infrastructure that we have. So if the regulator steps in, there is, you know, you know there, there will be a strong pressure on operators to fix this leak. So it's the fastest way to reduce uh, emission. And it's also a way to put everybody on this uh, journey of starting to measure, identify, and fix 
which is uh, easy to do because there are relatively few events. And when the next generation of satellites come, uh, companies will be used to that, regulators will be used to that. So it's uh, very, we move to a virtual cycles where we identify and uh, we uh, attribute, we quantify, we attribute, and we fix this, uh, this leaks. So I'll give you a few examples. The, the methodology is always the same. We detect the plumes automatically. Then we acquire the wind data. Then we run a, you know, tens of simulation until we have the best fit between the simulated plume and the observed plume. That gives us a zone, which is around 30 kilometers diameter, where there are the, the probable suspect from the emission. Now, this is not good enough. And then we use other Copernicus uh, satellite. Uh, in that case, we are using um, Sentinel-2 to detect flaring. And the, we've, so we've looked at activity on all the, the assets that we had on our database that could be leaking gas uh, of, uh, with uh, this kind of volume. And only one well, the one on the bottom in red, uh, uh, demonstrated abnormal behavior. And in fact, when there, was no, when there was methane, there was no flaring. And the day when the methane plume disappeared, then we've identified flaring at this specific well. We also made calculation of the volume flare versus the volume, the quantification of the plume, and they were exactly the same. So we know that uh, first our quantification method works well, but also we know that this is the well that have been emitting, you know, 80 tons per hour for several days uh, in this region. And we know the operators, and then uh, we can act uh, either with operators themselves or with the importer of the gas, the trader of the gas. So if this information is known, this will put a lot of pressure on operators to change their operating practice because this should not happen. Another example here, it's a gas pipeline to Europe. So the plume, the wind, and then you zoom. In that case, it was easy. There is only a, a compressor station. And uh, we estimated at 26 tons per hour the, the leaks for several days. This one also is easy. Uh, one and two, it's uh, the concentration, the wind. Uh, then you uh, do the simulation, you find the source, and then there is only one possible source here, which is a coal mine. Again, a coal mine could prevent doing this kind of leakage, but clearly they have not put in place the operational procedures to make sure that there is no methane leakage. Again, this can need, if we have regulator and investor pressure, to uh, changing uh, operational practices that will have an impact on uh, you know, our carbon budget very quickly. This one in the Permian, Permian is more complicated. As it's a center, there's a lot of uh, background noise with methane, but we still identify quite a few uh, abnormal events. Uh, in that case, you have the simulation. The big issue with um, the Permian is that there are a lot of wells uh, operation in the region. So in that case, uh, we use the um, other sensor, in that case, Sentinel-1 radar that detects uh, uh, metal. So in that case, we detect the fracking flu uh, fleets and Sentinel-2 to detect you know, through the optical to see whether there is activity on each of these sites. And in fact, among the 10 potential suspect, there is only one we has where we had some activity in the months uh, that um, were before these leaks, which is the only time where uh, such a kind of, such a huge leak could happen. So we know, so we, we come from oil and gas, we work with operators, so we know the process uh, in, the, in the region. Uh, so by, using Sentinel-5P and not, you know, other uh, better resolutions, uh, methane, you know, you know, sensor, but other sensors that look at activity, we know which well has been uh, producing this leak, so we can go to the operator, uh, which means that the regulator, investors, and the public can uh, have a pressure uh, to make sure that this does not happen again. So what do we do with that? Uh, uh, I'm showing what we've, do what we've done for the French uh, Ministry of Environment, where they ask, can you calculate the volume of flared uh, methane in the oil import of France? And uh, we've built this tool, so it's working now, um, where uh, first we measure the flared gas in the basin of origin. So that's uh, using VIRS. Then uh, we track the ships uh, going to the refineries by region, so we know where the oil is coming from. And then we associate the flared gas during the months in this region 
to the volume of oil that has been imported by this refinery. So de facto, you create a system where uh, you can calculate the volume of flared gas uh, in the import uh, in, the, in the European Union. And you can see that uh, the volume of oil is relatively stable, but the volume of flared gas varies a lot depending on the source, on the origin of, of oil. And the idea now is to do the same with methane. So we've uh, looked at all the detection, and this is only from, from ultra emitters uh, with, uh, you know, the, which is the 10 tons per hour, which is an empirical threshold for tropomy from what we found. So we've looked at all the uh, oil and gas basin, and uh, here we've classified them with low, medium, high, and very high number of uh, uh, ultra emitters uh, emission, you know, emission coming from ultra emitters coming from these basins or infrastructure. So the, it's a first step, and from that, as you can see, it is easy to uh, to do the, the same thing with the flared gas that we are doing uh, from vented gas, and we are doing flared gas to associate this volume of flared gas to import of oil or gas, which means that uh, this will give to uh, regulators an, an opportunity to create a border adjustment tax on energy imports. And the good news is that we can do it now. We don't have to wait for the next generation of satellite and sensors to be able to do that. So it means that today uh, we have, uh, you know, uh, we are seeing we are all, uh, I have four children. Uh, I'm sure we all are uh, very concerned uh, with the planet. And we have three choices. The first one is to wait for a global, bind a global binding treaty. So, uh, you know, in the, with the level of nationalism that we see these days, you know, good luck. Uh, the second one is to count on the goodwill of uh, individuals, companies, and government. So a lot of them have a lot of goodwill, but uh, probably not all of them. So it's uh, probably uh, not the safest path. Or uh, we can start now. We have the instruments, we have the technology, both on the hardware side and the software side, to measure, to start measuring uh, greenhouse gases globally. It's not, you know, it's the beginning, but we can start now and start regulating imports, uh, in particular in the EU where there is, you know, we are very conscious of what's going on here. So we, we think, you know, we've, uh, we've shared our, our uh, technology with the European Commission, and uh, they have a strategic plan. They are working on a strategic plan that is very aligned with uh, what we see. So we need to have a global view. We need to have a full supply chain. Uh, it cannot be, we cannot just look at Europe. We need to look at imported uh, emissions. And uh, we need to uh, measure, quantify, report using, in particular, satellite imagery, because uh, these are the only way to make sure that uh, we treat all the parts of the world on an even basis. And starting by super emitters and hotspots. So this is uh, what uh, we think we can do and we should do. The technology is not perfect, but it's a first step. The Europe has created a fantastic tool with Copernicus, the, the combination of Sentinel-5P, Sentinel-2, Sentinel-1, Sentinel-3 as well, you know, enables us to identify this plume and look at activity and attribute that to specific owners, yeah, I think it would be a shame not to do it now. So it's a call for action for regulators. We need better information. We can create that so that this will link to better decision, better energy, and better world. Thank you very much, Anton. It's a very strong statement. I will ask later on all the speakers because I have not too many questions in really to, well, to ask, what do you think about the choices proposed or, or brought forward by Antoine? Because he said, well, there are three basic options. What you would suggest is the right attitude. There is also a question from Florian. Uh, Florian uh, uh, that asks, uh, uh, well, what is, should be attitude towards uh, natural gas. I would bit expand it's gas and oil, basically, uh, how we should look upon. Jonathan said, well, gas would be for 30 years, at least with us. What about oil? Uh, 
but let's you you can think about it over and i will ask now uh, francisco de la flor who is director in Enegas, but uh, his main role, I think that he's really a leader for fighting methane emissions and understanding the issue in European midstream and downstream companies. Uh, so um, uh, Francisco, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pivals. I'm uh, quite happy to be here, quite happy to listen and to learn from uh, this um, uh, authorities in this uh, in, from the technological point of view. So um, my address could be uh, somehow different eh? because uh, uh, probably um, we uh, I try to to stick to the let's say to the to the ground on uh, on to what uh, we uh, what we do the the operators. Um, I, I will try also to start commenting um, on. To, on uh, what has been said until now, because I think it's uh, quite relevant, especially your question, uh, Andres, on where to uh, invest uh, uh, the money first uh, to get uh, the, the best outcome. This is absolutely relevant. And, and also I try to link with uh, something um, said or one of the charts displayed by uh, Stephen Hamburg, on these, um, um, where are the, the main uh, leakages, where are the main emissions? And uh, when I see uh, the, uh, the case of the US, of course, uh, and we analyze the ABC, the ABC, um, I, I realize that uh, the, uh, I mean, the segment where I'm, I'm placed, just the transmission and, and, uh, and distribution, uh, we are, I mean, represents a small part, it's a C, um, uh, just a small print with a small print. Um, uh, then, uh, yes, concentrate the, the resources, probably uh, concentrating the resources for these ultra emitters and super emitters, as Antoine was uh, referring, uh, could be the best for the uh, environment. Anyhow, um, uh, the gas industry yeah, and the, this segment in, in Europe uh, fully supports uh, the EU. Uh, climate neutrality uh, targets and recognizes the need to, to reduction uh, all greenhouse gas emissions, not only CO2. So that's uh, that's clear, eh? no doubt for uh, for those that uh, were um, thinking that we we were reluctant. This is not true. Uh, yes, please stay 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 here, um, um, Kiera. Um, the gas industry, our segment um, has successfully been working for many years to reduce methane emissions through mandatory and voluntary programs. And we remain strongly committed, committed to, to this issue. Uh, probably at the beginning was for safety, then for economical reasons, but uh, now also the environmental um, uh, focus is on, on our heads. Some of, some of us, eh, for, for instance, my, my, my own company, announce uh, officially commitments, uh, important commitments uh, to reach to 2050, 2050, but also the pathways to uh, intermediate milestones. So uh, next, please. Um, uh, we, um, we, what, what we have done, and uh, yes, in relation with uh, this, the topic of today, well, one year ago, um, we were, Mm, we finalized and presented uh, in the Madrid Forum for Gas Regulation this report that was uh, um, commissioned by, by DGNR uh, to, to GIE Marco Gas. GIE is uh, the um, as European Association representing the interest of the, uh, the midstream operators, LNG, uh, TSOs, and, and storage operators. And Marco Gas uh, was the other organization. Yes, the, is a technical, uh, let's say, the technical branch or the technical specialist in, in, the, gas, uh, in the gas sector in Europe was incorporated 52 years ago. So then um, we involve in that report, involve uh, the, uh, the entire gas value change from production to utilization, including biomethane, by the way, which is important. Here, let me express my special thanks to, to the Florence School of Regulation, Professor uh, Pivals, Maria, Paul, uh, and uh, Ricardo Volado, GRC, for the very valuable contribution to the document, because what we intend intended is just to uh, gather, let's say, the state of the art in, in different, um, from the different uh, angles. Then um, probably here, I, I, I should uh, share you something I'm, I'm 
um, particularly proud of this report that uh, one of the main goals of the preparation of the report was to, to raise the awareness of the gas industry players on, the, on, the, on this issue. And I think this has been achieved. So maybe two or three years ago, uh, when I was uh, just uh, referring to this topic, um, I mean, the reactions by some uh, top management in, in many companies, they say, please don't bother me. Uh, we, we have to, to concentrate on the quarter. Uh, don't, don't bother me with this. And now everybody now, or almost everybody is uh, so aware that is uh, really uh, try to, to cooperate uh, as much as possible. Uh, please click until the end of the slide, uh, Chara, please. Then the report, this report contains uh, information about uh, the two quantification approaches, the, the bottom up and the top down. And as we state in the report, something that uh, all or most of you perfectly know, methods applied uh, at a very large scales, typically involving many individual sources are generally referred to uh, as top-down assessment. And methods applied to scale um, at the scale of individual sources and then aggregated for a site are generally referred to uh, to bottom up as assessment. Um, I, I'm aware that for also aware that for most of you, uh, this is a, a basic uh, point, but uh, there are uh, 80, 90 people and it is good to, to have uh, this in mind. Then um, just the um, the both uh, bottom down and and, uh, and uh, top down and bottom down assessment have advantages and disadvantages. Uh, bottom up assessment provide detailed information, uh, and uh, um, and here we have seen in the top down and this uh, uh, the I mean the the, the, the what the um, different aerial from satellite to air bonds, uh, and drones etc can do. Um, the U uh, midstream, mid and downstream uh, segment mainly uses uh, bottom up, of course. Has, this is what has done for, for many years. Um, uh, and this approach is what, what for a time being, this is this were the, the only tools we used to have. Um, and we, we still believe that the that emissions, uh, that it's important that the emissions are quantified at individual uh, source levels. And, and the bottom-up uh, enables the evaluation, uh, prioritization, and efficient allocation of capital and human resources to target and mitigate the, uh, the methane emissions. Next, please. Chiara, right. Then um, we, in the report, as, as uh, Professor Peebles and, and probably many of you that had the opportunity to read this report, uh, contains uh, detailed information on detection, measurement, and quantification technologies. Probably is not so detailed as uh, uh, the, I mean, the, what the what you have shared on the, the, the um, on the area technologies, but uh, uh, good enough for to to get a, a complete picture of what we have. Um, as uh, also said by Stephen Carley, uh, for the same purpose, there are different technologies. The experience of gas industry has shown that it's necessary to select the best available uh, ones and uh, technologies and, and devices to detect and, and, and measure fugitive emissions. We have to recognize eh, here at our level, and that's why I find this is very interesting because I, I am learning a lot, that um, uh, the EU mystery sector has very limited experience with uh, top-down uh, methodologies. So that uh, what we are doing, eh, what we uh, just in a, from a very pragmatic point of view, eh, we are uh, launching. We have launched. We are working in a in a project uh, currently and under under definition to compare uh, the top down technologies to detect and, and measure methane emissions, and in addition, uh, to this project uh, will further contribute to to better understand the discrepancies between both approaches and to reconcile the data. There are uh, six companies. This is uh, under GERC, this uh, European, uh, let's say, uh, research uh, for gas. And are, these are the six companies. Uh, my own one uh, is alphabetical order. Uh, Fluxis, Hasuni, uh, Gas System, uh, de Gas, and uh, SNAM. So we, we try to work on this with our 
resources, the resources we may have. If only we had also uh, some contribution from the um, uh, funds from the European Commission just to, to enhance the quality of this report, because that will, uh, that will be very useful for uh, very useful result that we can share with all the, the gas uh, community. Next, please. Then, um, um, at the same time, what we what we do, just the midstreamers, uh, we work with uh, the methane guiding principles on the new best practice uh, guide for the identification, uh, detection, measurement, and quantification of methane emissions. So. Uh, I mean, again, we stick to, to, to the ground because uh, we believe that we have to provide to our uh, colleagues with um, just uh, the, not, not only the, um, I mean, the, the uh, extraordinary um, 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 new technological approach, but also uh, the, the, the methodology and uh, the, the basic for that. And many of our colleagues are um, also working for the basic. The best technology uh, depends on the characteristics of the facility, has been uh, said by some of you, and, uh, and the magnitude of the emissions and the cost effectiveness of the methods. Uh, I recognize the, the potential advantages that all technologies, including the satellites, could bring to the industry in the quantification emissions. But also attention has to be paid to the differences between uh, the upstream and mid and, uh, and downstream facilities and the differences in the emission fluxes. I refer again to what Stephen Hamburg has, has said. And, um, and, uh, um, and then concentrate on, on, the, on the important thing, on the, uh, when these uh, uh, big ultra and super emitters are. Uh, Copernicus, just a, a word on Copernicus. Uh, of course, uh, Copernicus is, um, uh, is more than welcome, and also the other satellites, because um, uh, with all of them and the uh, development in the coming years, that will uh, allow us to to, um, uh, to quantify, to learn, and to and reconciliate. In the future, uh, satellites. Um, for for me, is uh, I mean, for the industry is. Uh, uh, is quite clear, and, but um, and other top-down assessment will be uh, very useful uh, to compare this uh, source-specific data uh, to independent top-down quantifications. Then uh, both approach are, approaches are complementary. Data comparisons can be challenging, but nevertheless can uh, get continual improvements of inventory of methane emissions. Final remark from my side, final remark. We, uh, I say um, uh, that we are probably C uh, with small print, but, uh, and our segment is composed basically of regulated entities. And uh, uh, generally speaking, whatever we do um, um, has to be, uh, let's say, compensated by, by uh, the, the regulatory authorities so that uh, uh, we, uh, we are then uh, fully committed we can't uh, do our work. We are doing our work, but uh, um, we recognize that the bottom up is what we have done on all our life. Now, um, uh, very looking forward for this reconciliation as the project with Gerg is, uh, is um, uh, trying to, to demonstrate. Uh, um, I'll doubt, I would strongly recommend just uh, in a global, uh, in a global uh, and uh, topic, uh, concentrate on the places where the, uh, uh, the quick wins can be obtained. That's all, Professor Pivas. I can't hear you. You're muted, Andres. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So now I wanted to ask the first panel uh, just to react to what was said by Anton on Francisco. Uh, are you any consideration? Because the idea was today more going into technology, but we end up as usually with reality. So there is things that is happening. So when you try somehow connect our research and uh, science, technological development and real 
policy issues that are actually all interrelated. Sometimes you could say, well, technological development is not there. There was also an interesting question uh, by Paolo Prunzel. He basically said, well, we use equipment for safety measurement. So still some methane escapes. Perhaps the answer is that you have equipment that measures uh, uh, methane escaping. And uh, well, then you don't need uh, to have this complex IRL measurement. Any considerations for this? Who would like to start before Stephanie could make a conclusion? Jonathan? Sorry, I was typing a response in the question, so oh, but, no, no, <laughs> I'm no, answering no. too many things. Go, no, go that's somebody very much first. appreciate somebody, <laughs> uh, Stephen or Ilsa. Um, sure, so I think that the use of um, the current safety equipment is certainly integral to reducing methane emissions. However, the sensitivity of most of that equipment is not sufficient. And there's a wide gap between safety and minimization of emissions. So for him, uh, and I'll just use an example from local distribution. Most utilities have, must have and, and do have good safety programs. But the, but the concentrations you need to be able to detect to ensure there's no explosion in a local distribution is very different. So we've shown across dozen more cities in the US and there are comparable studies currently ongoing in the EU that the majority of emissions are missed uh, or certainly the majority of leaks are missed using that equipment. And you can reduce in the United States on average at least half those emissions by simply using better equipment that finds smaller leaks and does it more rapidly. So there's, this is an and. You can, the safety is critical, but we need this new generation of technology to ensure that we can measure emissions in a much more accurate and uh, precise way so that we can find them where previously they were invisible. And then we can reduce them dramatically across the supply chain from production all the way to delivery and including end use, which we haven't talked about at all. Ilse? I don't have much to, to, to add to that uh, on this point. Okay. So uh, 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 then I should ask Stephanie yeah, to make a conclusion and then if anybody would have any comments on her. So let's focus on Stephanie's uh, uh, Sonier uh, conclusion. Stephanie is uh, uh, with Carbon Limits. Uh, she's executive director and well known in the societies that fights uh, all type of uh, well, uh, emissions just to really get a uh, well, clean and safe planet. Uh, Stephanie, please. Uh, thank you, uh, Andres. So it's been a very interesting afternoon and we have had uh, many very uh, high quality presentation. And as Andres said, I have the challenging task of summarizing it all. And uh, I'm a really strong believer in summary figures. So today I will present um, a summary figure for, uh, for the day. Um, so when we discuss about monitoring, particularly monitoring uh, methane, the question is, what is the monitoring objectives? And they have very, very different monitoring objectives. And depending on them, there's different uh, technology. And we reviewed some of them today. So there's doing basin-wide emission estimates, as Kay Rose presented, facility emission estimates, as uh, uh, scientific aviation presented, identifying super or large emitters, or identifying, identifying emission source and plan mitigation uh, at a more detailed level. And we've reviewed, I would say, three categories of uh, technology. First, uh, the plane. Uh, secondly, the uh, satellite, the current, uh, existing satellite, including Tromponi, and the last one is the future coming satellites. So if I try to fill a matrix, um, this is how it could look like. For the basin-wide emission estimates, uh, plane, the current satellite, and obviously the future satellites uh, are 
uh, have been providing a lot of detailed uh, data and shown over a number of uh, basin what are the emission looks like and they may be quite different than what people thought in the first place. It has been mainly performed at research level, um, so uh, it's coming to be done now at, um, uh, by private company as well. Uh, and the question is, how can it be scaled up and how can we do more of that in the future? Then there's the facility, facility emission estimates, where the plane um, can Current satellite provide an answer in some site. I come back when it's very large emitters, but for many sites, the, uh, the current satellite won't give uh, an emission estimates. And then, as time comes, depending on the um, depending on the threshold, uh, the sa future satellite can provide more uh, estimates at the facility level. Um, there's obviously some specific challenge for some segments. So if you're offshore, the challenge are a bit different than if you're onshore, um, for example. Then there's identifying the super large emitter. And as I think Stephen uh, mentioned, there's not one single definition. So depending on the definition, the answer is a, a bit different. But we can see that the planes um, have a load to find super large, whatever, the, the big the big emission source. Current satellites allow to find in particular what uh, Antoine has described as the ultra emitters and the future satellites should should be able to help map those even more efficiently and allow to address them more efficiently. And uh, the last point is identifying the emission source, so which of my valve, my compressor is actually emitting. And that's obviously not something the aerial uh, measurements uh, uh, are intended to do. So obviously with the planes, uh, sometimes we can, for example, uh, uh, estimate the emission from a flare, but you know, this is a completely different realm of technology to do this last objective and I guess it's a, it can be a topic for another webinar. Uh, voila, so that's, that was kind of a, a, a brief summary um, of today's discussion. And I hope everybody has found it as interesting as I have. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Any comments from the speaker, what uh, Stephanie presented to you? As usually, whenever you present something in the graph, well, you need to have some uh, simplification. Do you agree with everything what Stephanie has put it, or you have uh, some, well, uh, observations uh, how it could be improved? Anybody? Well, this is uh, Steve Hamper. Um, I'll just add one comment that I think, I'm not sure it's, uh, it, it's an addition to I, what Stephanie said. And I was also typing, it's been hard to do all the questions and trying to answer things. So I, I don't think I missed, um, which is uh, a point that Antoine made uh, and Ilza also referred to is the routine quantification and the development of the algorithms. Um, one of the really key factors, and we're spending a lot of time on it. I know others are Antoine and his team at Kairos are is being able to convert all of these data to quantitative estimates that are spatially explicit in near real time. And we have a major effort doing that at EDF as part of MethaneSat, and there are others. And that's the revolution. When that happens, we have a revolution because now near real time measurements, so whether it's Tropomi or MethaneSat, um, Steve can do it uh, pretty well in his scientific aviation, but everything still requires the touch of scientists, the touch, but we are on the cusp of turning it into automated uh, data that will create real-time quantitative estimates at a scale that we've never seen before. That's the revolution and it will be here. I mean, Antoine showed us great tidbits, starting places. It will be here very soon. And that is a complete and utter change in what we know and how we know it. And I'll just use an illustration. We did this uh, not quite in real time with local distribution in the United States. We're working with Google. Uh, we developed a system to be able to collect data while driving, quantify it, map it, and present it to the public with sized leaks. We did this for more than a dozen US cities and that changed the relationship with regulators, that changed the relationship with the public 
It, we, we also made sure that people understood the data. We did a lot of testing so people weren't scared by the data because obviously if there were safety issues, those were addressed by the company as soon as they were discovered. Um, and anyway, I just add, I think that's an important piece to recognize there are two parts of the technology. The first is the collecting the data, but the second is the processing and they're equally important. And again, Antoine and Ilza and Stephanie, I see nodding. I think that's the part we have to remember and we're making great progress in both. Yeah, this is happening very fast. Um, today, our process from, uh, you know, Sentinel-5P to quantification is almost fully um, uh, automated. We just have uh, a human in the loop at the end to make sure that uh, there is no artifact or albedo effect uh, on, the, on the quantification. So we are making huge progress around that uh, with all the computing power that we have and, uh, you know, the history, um, historical data set that we get from, uh, from Tropomi. I think the, the most important thing is that uh, all the sensors, and uh, we are using extensively Sentinel-1 uh, and the 2, but also uh, Worldview 3, you know, all the sensors are bringing a lot of information to attribute to sources. So uh, it's never a sensor, it's, it's not a unique sensor policy that will work. Uh, we need uh, satellites, we need planes, we need drones, we need other satellites for activity. But today we believe that we have something that is workable. And as Steve just said, we have enough to change to, to change the mindset of regulators, investors, and companies to realize that uh, they cannot hide anymore. That's a revolution, you know. You know, they, we can see largely there are many of them, and it's obvious that uh, once investors understand that we can measure the quality of their portfolio companies, they will uh, put some pressure on operators to change uh, the way to do business. So. It's not perfect. We need the next level of, of satellites, but we need to start now because it will take time for uh, the mindset of regulators and investors and operators to change, to actually use this information to do something about it. Anybody else? Uh, if not, could I ask another question that uh, comes from my understanding of issue? Well, uh, oil and gas and energy sector in general is one of the metals. There is also agriculture and waste management. Do the same technologies apply for monitoring? So aerial measurement could be used in the same scale or it should be somehow different or that should be completely different methods being used. Um, I'll take a shot at that again. Since we've been working on um, methane emissions also from rice, uh, we've done some work in India and uh, elsewhere. And um, they're related, but not the same. Like any science, it's really critically important that we um, understand how they're the same and how they're different. So that the, obviously the methane is methane. So, and Steve uh, part Connolly participated. We did a project in California with multiple technologies looking at agricultural uh, methane emissions from dairies. So this is a large source of methane in California, in the United States. And uh, Steve flew and we had on the ground folks and we did this similar kind of work there to understand uh, the limitations. Um, as I mentioned for methane sat, uh, New Zealand uh, is, part is a partner and they are focusing a lot of scientific activity over the next couple of years to be able to use methane sat to quantify agricultural emissions the way that we're focused on oil and gas. So yes, you can do it, but we shouldn't just assume one translates to the other because for example, um, intensive cattle uh, operations might look like an oil and gas facility, but extensive will not. Uh, rice production, which has high seasonality in ways that oil and gas does not. So there are important differences that we have to be careful to not just take what we've learned in oil and gas and apply it to these other sources because we could get spurious inferences and we're conscious of that. But yes, overall, this will apply to other sources and the technology you can use. Again, though, the detection thresholds matter. You have very, if you have very large diffuse sources, large areas, then you need another set of, that's one of the things the methane set will be able to do well, um, technologies to look at these more diffuse area sources as opposed to concentrated point sources. Anybody else? would like to comment on it? No, I think just uh, maybe, um, uh, so Steve, when you're talking uh, new technologies, we mean basically 
uh, how to deal with the data because um, we measure these sources probably, but they're more diffuse, most, some of them. And so they, they overlap with their signature in, in how we see the concentration fields. And that makes it more complex than just looking at really localized point sources. But these things are being developed and uh, hopefully we'll see some first results uh, soon using, for example, Tropomi data. Good, good. Well, um, so uh, anybody would like to make any comment on uh, what has was heard because I have no more questions. I think you have been very nice in answering the questions. There was also a written question about global agreement, but um, I assume that uh, uh, Jonathan has answered quite well. Nobody is against a uh, global agreement, but it can't be never excuse for not doing things what you can do now. So I think it's always welcome uh, if people could uh, agree. That's not a question. But if you have technological development and there is uh, really need to advance, that is a uh, very rather crucial. So I believe that today have been excellent uh, uh, webinar. I think uh, you covered excellent ground on the technologies, on its application, what could be achieved. And it was really, really impressive uh, guidance. Uh, I think Antoine was uh, saying, well, now it is to the regulators. So uh, the next workshop, it is next uh, uh, Monday, uh, 8th of June. Uh, starts uh, at three o'clock, uh, well, uh, Florence time until five o'clock. And that's exactly, we'll look on, uh, on on issues related. One is how to incorporate RL measurements and maintain policies and regulation. And another round table will look how to make the regulation open to the development of new technologies. So it's basically also very much connected like today, both panels basically goes, well, we have technology, we have a political imperative and how you make the regulation work and how you make uh, it transparent enough and equitable enough. So it is rather interesting uh, conclusions that uh, people that I assume they followed or they will uh, view recording of today's webinar as uh, they make and I'm looking very much forward what, what they will propose. Uh, it's also true that the next seminar is only a couple of days uh, before their very important event, like precursor of the EU's uh, methane uh, strategy. I am also looking very much forward. I know that there is discussion going. I hope that it is uh, will come as ambitious as it can, because for strategy, it's always should be ambition. Definitely legislative acts usually is more of the balance, but I, I hope that strategy will be done as ambitious as possible. It's good that there is also links coming with agriculture and also waste management. Today, we heard that there are nuances, but you can't overlook any source of methane emissions because first of all, it's not fair, but second, it's also waste of resources. And it will be moderated by uh, Maria Olchak, my colleague, I am colleague, and I also go grateful for all the work she made in preparing this workshop. So thank you very much. Uh, so I'm uh, hoping uh, all of our audience to see also next Monday. There is no public holiday. That's also good news uh, in 